This video is sponsored by Manscaped. Thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. This is the story of American Airlines Flight 132. On the 3rd of February, 1988, an American Airlines DC-9 was on its way from Dallas-Fort Worth to Nashville, Tennessee. Flight 132 had 120 passengers, four cabin crew members, and two pilots on board. The flight to Nashville was boring, nothing out of the ordinary. The climb, cruise, and descent all were routine. Soon the plane was lining up for the approach into Nashville. In the cabin, the cabin crew members were all busy securing the cabin for the landing. One of the cabin crew members went into the laboratory, and when she came out, she found another cabin crew member checking the seats. Apparently, the cabin was filling with a light, thin smoke, and she was trying to find the source of the smoke. Minutes later, a passenger sitting in seat 17 Echo noticed smoke coming out from the seams of the carpet floor. The cabin now started to fill with this, quote, burning electrical smell. The plane was still 5,000 feet from landing, and if there was a fire on board, then they would have to land this plane as fast as possible. The cabin crew immediately got in contact with the pilots. She said, we've got smoke in the cabin and we don't know where it's coming from. The pilots had just gotten their first warning that something was seriously wrong on this plane. Just as the cabin crew member told the first officer about the smell, the first officer smelled the burning smell for the first time. The captain wanted specifics. He wanted to know if there were fumes or smoke in the cabin. As the pilots wrangled with the possibility of a fire on board, a flight attendant got into the area with a fire extinguisher, expecting to find a smoldering cigarette or something like that. But no cigarette could be found. The first-class flight attendant, looking back into the economy section, could see that the area was now starting to fill up with a light mist. They started removing seat cushions to see if any of them were smoldering. But a passenger in seat 16 Echo now saw smoke coming from the floor as well. Within minutes, passengers in seats 17 Bravo and 17 Foxtrot were now reporting fumes as well. This fire that they couldn't find was spreading, and it was spreading fast. The cabin crew members, unable to find the source of the fire, asked an off-duty first officer in the cabin for help. He then made a shocking discovery. The floor behind row 15 was hot and soft. The fire wasn't in the cabin, it was below them. Whatever the source of the fire was, it must have been burning hot if the floor was starting to melt. Also, side note, this would be the perfect setting for a game of The Floor is Lava. Immediately, everyone started moving passengers in the melting zone away to other seats. In the cockpit, the captain still wanted to know if they were dealing with smoke or fumes. The flight attendant told the first officer that a pilot had told her that the floor was hot and soft and that they needed to land as soon as possible. The first officer wanted to know who was giving the flight attendant this information, so she handed the phone over to the off-duty pilot. He said that he was a 727 first officer, and then said the following. You got the floor back here in the middle dropping out slightly. You have to land this thing in a hurry. The first officer now knew how serious things were back there, and said, okay, we're getting it down now. The off-duty first officer added, have trucks meet us on the runway, referring to the fire trucks. But the first officer didn't hear that as he was already putting the inner phone away. The pilots rushed to get the plane ready for landing. The captain again wanted to know if the cabin had smoke or fumes. The flight attendant responded with bad fumes. The fumes were so bad that her eyes were starting to burn at this point. As the approach continued, the acrid fumes in the cockpit grew stronger and stronger. As heat in the cabin built up, Flight 132 made an emergency landing at Nashville. As the plane started to taxi off the runway and onto taxiway Tango 2, the off-duty first officer realized that the pilots weren't starting an immediate evacuation. So he went up to the phone and said to the pilots, You've got a big problem back here. The heat is coming up through the floor and we better get out of here. Finally understanding the gravity of the situation, the pilots stopped the plane and let ATC know about a potential cargo fire. They then immediately started an evacuation of the plane. Once ground crews caught up with the captain, they asked him what the problem was, and he said that there was a fire in the cargo area. So they opened up the aft cargo compartment, and there was nothing there. But when they opened up the mid-cargo compartment, thick smoke forced its way out of the opening. In the end, 
everyone survived. When they inspected the area where the fire was, they found that aluminum beams in the area had been subjected to so much heat that they had lost their structural strength and had to be replaced. Moreover, aluminum support straps in the area had melted and vital control cables and fuel lines had been charred. Just for some context, aluminum melts at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit or 648 degrees Celsius. All in all, this was one incident that could have been much more worse. They were able to get this plane down as fast as they did because they were already on final. But had this happened in cruise or if they did not have a diversion airport nearby, then this might have ended very differently. Also, this report is interesting because it gives us a dollar amount spent on repairing the plane and getting it back into service. Pause the video, go down into the comments, and leave your best guess. Well, are you back? It took $228,000 to fix this plane up. I mean, not too bad, to be honest. Now, the million dollar, or should I say $228,000 question is, what started the fire? Well, as it turned out, looking through the cargo manifest of the plane turned up quite a few questionable objects. The plane had a 104-pound drum of textile treatment chemicals, which included 5 gallons of hydrogen peroxide and 25 pounds of a substance called sodium orthosilicate mixture. Here's the real kicker. All of this was undeclared and packed improperly, which meant that the pilots had no idea that they were carrying this stuff at all. The thing is, hydrogen peroxide is a strong oxidizing agent, and if it is in contact with organic materials, it will cause an exothermic reaction, meaning that it will produce a lot of heat. But the investigators, these guys are scientists, so they wanted to know the specific mechanism that caused the fire in the first place. So they carried out a bunch of tests. They varied the amount of each chemical to see which fire most closely resembled the fire on the plane. It's basically high-tech trial and error. Their findings were interesting to say the least. You see, to get a fire like the one seen on American Airlines Flight 132, the sodium orthosilicate mixture and the hydrogen peroxide needed to combine in a container that had been pre-soaked and dried with hydrogen peroxide. So the investigators think that the hydrogen peroxide leaked from its container, thus wetting the drum, and then it dried. And then it leaked a second time and when it leaked a second time, it came into contact with the sodium orthosilicate mixture and the dried hydrogen peroxide soaked drum. And that weird combination caused a massive exothermic reaction, which started the fire. Well, how did the hydrogen peroxide leak, you ask? The huge drum that held it was on its side, and there were no markings on the drum itself, asking that it should be oriented in one way or another. Basically, there was no this way up sticker on the drum, which is very important in cases like these. Looking further into the matter, they found out that the hydrogen peroxide was at a concentration of 50%. Now, as per the Department of Transport, 50% concentration of hydrogen peroxide should be nowhere near a passenger carrying aircraft. In fact, the highest concentration that you can carry is 35%, and that's only if it's one quart of the stuff. Someone really broke the rules here. On top of that, the drums that were carrying these hazardous chemicals were not marked as such. There were no warning signs, no labels, no nothing. The shipper, which was a company called Textiles Treatments, which was based in Texas, did not describe the contents of the drum correctly. In fact, they tracked down the clerk that checked the drum in to see what the clerk remembered from their exchange. Two guys came in with a drum in a pickup truck and said that they needed this ship to Nashville to demonstrate their process to a potential client. When asked about what was in the drums, they just said laundry equipment. Since that sounded pretty benign, the clerk accepted the package. No one said anything about chemicals being involved. Had they said that this drum had chemicals in it, then that might have triggered some additional scrutiny. This brought some heat on American Airlines as well. You see, American Airlines had a checklist for hazardous materials to see if they were okay to fly, but their regular check-in process did not have a method to identify potentially harmful materials. So after this incident, they changed the rules to disallow broad generic description of items. You had to be specific with what you want to ship. In this case, the true heroes of the story are the flight attendants on duty and the off-duty first officer. 
They were at the forefront of this emergency. Had they not taken initiative, then the pilots may have delayed the evacuation quite a bit. To the pilots out there, why was the captain so intent on knowing if the cabin was filling up with smoke or fumes? Does it really make a big difference? Or are there separate checklists for smoke and fumes? I'd love to get your thoughts. Also, this incident is very similar to another video that I made, Pan Am Flight 160. I don't know if this video will be out by the time that that one comes out. If it is, I'll leave a link to it on screen. But Pan Am Flight 160 is a harsh, sad reminder that chemical fires on board airplanes can be deadly. But before we wrap up this video, here's a message from our sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is the go-to brand for men's hygiene and grooming. The highlight of their lineup is the Lawnmower 4.0. It's the fourth generation trimmer, hence the 4.0. The Lawnmower 4.0 has active skin safe technology that reduces cuts and nicks all over your body. Also, did I mention that it's waterproof and it's cordless? I swear, what will they think of next? That's in addition to their Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer, which has skin safe technology so that you are nick free everywhere. Manscaped has you covered from head to toe. Get 20% off with free international shipping using the code MINI at the link in the description. Again, thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.